Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Baxi's Musical Podcast. If you like what you hear today, be sure to subscribe to it, like it, share it with everyone you know. And if you can leave a big, fat review, that would be awesome. Also, be sure to check out Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for regular updates on what's coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by Metro Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Chicopee. Visit Metro's state-of-the-art dealership right next to BJ's and Big Y on Memorial Drive in Chicopee. Or visit MetroJeep.com and drive home with your new Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram today. And now, here's my reasonably lengthy introduction to my interview with Jack Grisham from TSOL on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Musical By 1978-79, the first generation of American punk had pretty much run its course. And while there was still great music that came out back then, things were definitely starting to change. Many of those early New York and British punk bands were breaking up or signing lucrative record contracts or fading into oblivion with drugs and alcohol, and for some, the music was no longer angry enough. Vietnam was over. Watergate had come and gone. But you still had communists and nuclear power and disco and Ronald Reagan and REO Speedwagon. These were not good times. Something needed to happen. You needed something to out-punk punk. You needed something that not only reflected a whole new set of problems, you needed something that was going to feel like a shot to the face. What you needed was hardcore. This is when punk was beginning to move beyond the big cities like New York and worm its way into the suburbs and other quieter parts of America. And the kids in those areas were every bit as disaffected, if not more so, than the kids going to the Bowery to watch the Talking Heads play Psycho Killer at CBGB's every couple of weeks. Not that there was anything wrong with that, but a lot had changed over the course of two years. Now it was time to really piss your parents off. And it worked. Unlike what you may have seen in New York just a year or two earlier, hardcore was more aggressive, faster, angrier, and a whole lot more threatening, which would explain why so many parents hated it and so many hardcore shows were disrupted by police. And for many, the ground zero of hardcore was in California. Beginning in San Francisco, you had bands like The Mutants, The Offs, and The Dead Kennedys. In Orange County, you had The Germs, X, and The Weirdos. And in Southern California, you had Black Flag, Fear, and The Circle Jerks. This then sparked a whole tidal wave of bands to emerge, like The Minutemen, The Descendants, The Adolescents, Social Distortion, and bands like TSOL. Now, TSOL are an interesting case. TSOL, or the True Sounds of Liberty, were out of Long Beach, California. And unlike a lot of hardcore bands that would wind up painting themselves into a corner, TSOL would be one of the few bands that never stood in the same place for too long. They also never shied away from a good melody and were never afraid to start causing trouble. In 1981, TSOL would release an incredible self-titled five-song EP that was charged up with highly political lyrics that seemed hell-bent on total anarchy with songs like Abolish Government, Property is Theft, and World War III. Later in the year, they would release their first full-length record, Dance With Me. That record was far less political but no less brutal. Between those two recordings and their next two albums, 1983's Beneath the Shadows and Change Today, which was released the following year, all those records are considered to be hardcore classics in spite of their constantly evolving approach. The lead singer of TSOL at the time was Jack Grisham. At six foot three inches tall, Jack Grisham was a physically imposing, often intimidating presence during a period where hardcore shows were becoming more violent and more aggressive. But it was that presence that made Jack a true legend in hardcore circles. But it would be the violence that would eventually prompt him to leave the band, at least temporarily. In the years that would follow, Jack would find himself in a number of other bands. He wrote several books, including several novels and a couple of memoirs. He's also found himself in a number of films, including the TSOL documentary, Ignore Heroes. But he's also found himself getting sober, where he has been for 35 years. In 2001, Jack rejoined TSOL, where he has been ever since. And TSOL are back again with their 12th album, this one entitled A-Side Graffiti. And it's an absolute blast. And as a longtime fan, it has been a real pleasure to talk to Jack Grisham from TSOL on Baxi's Musical Podcast. I'm stoked. My kid just got me a 
I just went out and my kid's been walking me every day like a dog, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's pouring rain. It's raining here and it's cold and it's windy and she drags my ass out onto the beach. <laughs> you know, when she's 25, doesn't that, you know, she's like a machine. She works out twice a day. It's like, fuck. How messed up is that where you, where like, you know, guys our age need to be, need to be, need to be walked. <laughs> walked. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Uh, it's all right. As long as you're not scooting on the carpet, I think you're probably in good shape. Yeah. Yeah. She's not having to <laughs> clean my anal glands. <laughs> all right. But my other, my, my other daughter has tried to commit me numerous times, like numerous, like legitimately one time she did an intervention on me. Really? We can chat about this later. If you like to, so. <laughs> no, we'll definitely we'll definitely get into that. But uh, I'm so glad to have you here. I'm, I've uh, I've been a TSOL fan for a, for a good long time, and I just got the uh, a preview of the new record, A Side Graffiti. And I think it's an absolute blast. I think anytime you can get Keith Morris to join you singing show <laughs> tunes, that's freaking priceless. Keith owed me, man. So I, <laughs> I hit him up. I'm friends with Keith, right? And I had been in a couple of, uh, have you ever seen those off videos that they yeah, did? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm in Hypnotized. I play Captain America and I urinate on David Yao. And so, <laughs> so then, he's got, then he's got me playing a stormtrooper. He's, he's always calling, saying, all right, can you get in this video? So so when it came time, who better is Brad than Keith Morris? You know, I, it's like, I, I'll go back to the car. <laughs> I mean, it, you're singing "Sweet Transvestite" from Rocky Horror. I mean, you have to have him as Brad as like an inspired piece of casting. Right? There's nobody that could be Brad more than Keith Morris. <laughs> That's right. yeah, not a not a lot of work. No, on this part there's no no acting involved. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was like his his whole life was meant for that moment, and you were able to capture oh, it. Good God. for you. But it's a it's a great uh, cover, and actually, there's a couple of really good covers on the, on the record. I love. Uh, what you did with a wonderful world, an update with strings. People probably don't expect that from TSOL, but it came out really good. Real strings. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and it was so cool. And it was so cool how we got the strings. So I was doing, uh, so John Doe from X is he's released a couple of books with Tom DeSavia and, and I, I've written chapters in each of the books. Mm -hmm. And so on the last book, he had me come and, um, I shot photos of the people reading too. So I'm hanging out the studio and uh, somebody wanted to hear our cover of, of, of that, right? Wonderful World. And we played it. And, and this guy goes, man, he goes, you need real string. You need some strings on that. I go, yeah, if I could afford real strings. He goes, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> he, happened, he happened to have a string quartet called the Section Quartet. And I sent him the track and he, and he just, you know, he, he laid it all out. And then him and a cello player came over and just... We're great. That's I mean, awesome. so unbelievable. But even the uh, the originals are good. Swimming, the uh, the first single is really good. I loved uh, Rhythm of Cruelty. The, the record is really, I think, a really strong, fun record. Well, which is complete. <laughs> Here's <laughs> I've finally realized now that I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Right? <laughs> this is what, I mean, it's only taken me to be 62 years old because none of this was meant to be a record. Yeah. So all this is is like, I'm trying to explain it to somebody. So, so for me, it's just kind of poking around. Like I like when you make a record, like our last record, the trigger complex, it's a cohesive, the whole record goes here. It's meant to be listened from start to finish. It's a, it's a record. Sure. I've always liked that. And, uh, but for this, it was just little stabs. It's like, Oh, what would it sound like if we did that? Oh, what would this sound like? And so we were just like, trying shit and and my guys the guys in the band they, they're very nice to me they go along i'll come up with something they go okay great let's try it you know so uh so it was really just little bits and pieces and then paul rossler and i were talking and and thought god we should put all these together i think paul was the one who said we should put them all together and put it out and uh and we did. Well, I mean, it's not, there's something to be said about when you're when you hear a band clearly having fun doing stuff, even if it's just you know you know screwing around, and, but they're having fun. That's the sense I got from listening to the record. This was just this was fun for you guys. And and exact and that was it. Like there was nothing involved in this. And I think maybe maybe that was the cool part about it. It there there was no plan. There was no real ego involved. It was like, hey hey, you know. Like the Anne Marie. <laughs> have you heard that the original of that? Yeah, I have. So, 
Okay, so I'm li- so so I like go-go beats and stuff, right? So somebody was telling me, oh, check out these go-go beats, and then listen to the Sam Marie song, and I'm listening to it, right? And I'm thinking, oh, what a cool groove, man! That groove's just badass. And uh, <laughs> and so anyway, and then I listen to the words, and she's singing to a boy, she's singing to a man or whatever the hell you want to call it. And she says, okay, hey, look, I hear what you're saying, but oh, there's one thing you've done that's got me tripping, man, but hang on. And so she's pissed at him and she says, I got my car keys in the hands. My boots are coming across the floor. And I thought, oh my God, this sounds like a <laughs> protest song. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a group singing to the government. Yeah, 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 I get it, flying the flag, bitch, but hang on a minute, <laughs> there's just one thing down in Latin America that's got me tripping, you know, <laughs> this Vietnam, this involvement here, here. And so, so it was all those things that kind of came in my head. And, and I thought, God, this would be a cool song for like rage and against the machine to do. And then I think, oh, fuck it. We'll just do it. Let's do it. And I did not let the guys hear the original song. So, uh, they would. I don't know. That would have been. That would have been a tough fight getting that going. Yeah, but it, but the end result was that it sounds like you guys are still having fun, and I, I, yeah, I think that's awesome when that happens because so many times you know, a band will get together. It's it's just it's so serious and so uh, militaristic in a way, and uh, like and how they approach it. But it, to me, it's fun when when a band kind of you know, fucks around like that. Like you know, even with, with Keith Morris, I mean, I I I like Golden Shower hits. I think that album is yeah, funny, yeah. I, and I, and it still makes me laugh even after all all these years well and i think it's difficult also for like what, what people don't if you look at the 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 hardcore bands whatever the hell you want to call it that are still around these days what what, what who are you man it, it's like i think to myself what what am i just i'm going through the motions i've done this song a hundred times it's like we're not really a band we're we're a corporation that belongs in the county fair now you know it's, it's like what whatever the hell it is so so it's nice to just not have any limitations. You're just doing whatever the hell you want and fuck everybody. Yeah. Really. Well, and, it and, comes to- and at our age, it's kind of hard to be, you know, say, you know, you, you Nazi punks fuck off when all you're really worried about is the size of your prostate. I mean, you're, you're in a different well, time in your life too. Yeah. And that's the other thing. It's like, great. Okay, good. Somebody asked me one time, they go, well, how have your thoughts about so-and-so have changed? It's like, hang on a minute, man. I, I'm I'm still basically a, a socio-anarchist or whatever the hell it is, man. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I've already said that. I've already said, fuck these guys. Nothing's changed. You know, it's like, one time I was sitting on stage and I thought, God damn, we've been doing this for so long. How many presidents <laughs> have I gone through, you know, a couple of bushes, you know, it started with Carter, then, you know, and yep. it's Reagan, a couple of Bush. I like it when they go double sessions because I don't forget who's, in, <laughs> who's supposedly on the throne. You, you know, I mean, I can write it for a little bit. It's so funny. Cause I mean, I mean, yeah, you can, you can, you can keep anger going for a good eight years. That's uh, you don't have to change at all. That's- yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you the, fun- somebody asked me one time, they said, well, what's the biggest difference between punk rock these days and when you were young, a kid, <laughs> I think, well, here's the biggest difference is when I was a kid, I didn't get letters from other punks calling me a commie for saying, fuck the president. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever it is. Oh my God. The first time I got one of those, I thought "Ah, I'm, I'm in the wrong business. (laughs) I started off telling you that I've been a big fan for a long time. I remember I was in college and I I got my copy of, uh, you know, beneath the shadows, which is a record that I absolutely loved. And, and, and yeah, I'm I'm in the uh, dorms in college and some asshole steals it. So it, you know, it's gone. Yeah, you know, as a college student, I got no money, so I'm finding ways of trying to scrape money. I'm, you know, donating plasma to the blood center, anything I can do to get a, get a few bucks. And I go to the record store, and the guy behind the counter convinces me that I need to buy the new album, which was Hit and Run, which isn't even an album you're on. And I and I listened right. to him, and I bought it, and I was I listened to it two or three times. And I said, you know what, the best TSOL is Jack Grisham TSOL, and I still I still feel that way. And then I finally went and go buy and bought the CD, and I'm like, oh, oh there fantastic. You go. I got it back now, but it's funny how the great part about TSOL, and I always appreciate the irony of it all, is you guys were a band that were never afraid of a good melody, while at the same time never afraid to punch a guy in the throat if he's acting up at a show. I mean, to me, the the irony of that is pretty powerful, and one of the reasons why I've always appreciated TSOL's music. 
Yeah, it's pretty, you know, I tell you, so so we're getting ready to play a show one night, right? And I got this, uh, I had just been to the Huntington Library and saw Pinky and Blue Boy, those two paintings, right? Mm -hmm. So I had myself decked out as a real dandy, right? You know, <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all decked out. And so I'm wandering around, like, and it's a packed show, and I'm wandering around, and, and I'm in the bathroom, and some two guys come in, and and I hear the one guy go, look at this fucking faggot. Like <laughs> like in the bathroom, right? So I'm urinating. I just sit there, you know, minding my own business. And then they walk out and the guy's got TSOL on the back of his jacket. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, yeah, man, I'd love to see that guy's face in 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, just I mean, crazy. Regardless of how you're dressed, I mean, you're a pretty imposing guy, you know, six foot four. You would be like the last guy I'd probably want to pop off to. But I'm the nicest person. Clearly, clearly that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, it's uh, you know, and I I used to make this show yeah, in the first book I wrote, American Demon. I was telling this story about uh, getting in a fight where you're in a dress, and yeah. and you always win. You've always <laughs> won. You've won. The minute that somebody comes up to you and, and wants to fight you and you're wearing a dress, you've already won. And I, I tried to explain, I was, this guy was wanted to fight me. Right. right. And, and he was very aggressive. And, and I said, all right, let me just, let me just run this down to you. Right. First of all, take a look at me. I'm six, four, I'm wearing a Chanel evening gown and I'm quite comfortable in it. So, so, you know, you know that this is not my first time putting on a dress. Then look at my face. Very, very handsome. My nose is straight, not a scar or mark. Now let your gaze drop down to my knuckles and see the teeth marks all over my knuckles. So you realize that I've been in a dress and have fought before. Now, if you fight me and you win, all you can say is you beat up a guy in a dress and there's nothing cool about that. I go, but chances are I'm going to stomp the living fuck out of you <laughs> and you just got your ass kicked by a six foot four faggot in a chanel gown now what are you gonna do <laughs> so, <laughs> and the guy just walked off because <laughs> you've well, already won you've you already know? won without a punch being thrown <laughs> so i started watching i haven't finished it yet i just started watching uh, ignore heroes the documentary that you put out last year and i right. i absolutely loved the opening sequence, kind of like where you're giving a TED talk and the audience is nothing but cops and nuns. And again, another inspired <laughs> a TSOL decision. But I just thought the whole thing was really interesting because, you know, the TSOL story, there's a lot of ups and downs with it. And it's, it's, an, it's an important story, I think, in, in a lot of ways. And, and the idea that you guys, after everything that has gone through just with you personally getting back together, I think is really very very cool because a lot of bands at some point just say ah fuck it i don't want to do this ever again and then they just move on with their lives but you guys felt compelled to come back and really tell the story tell me about putting this film together and 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 where does it go from here i mean is, is there any kind of streaming distribution beyond uh, i think i saw it on tubi i don't know if there's anything beyond that no not really okay so all right so this is interesting also so so I had uh, I had made a movie about child abuse. That was the first. I used to carry a camera with me all the time when I was a kid, and right. um, and I just stopped. It's one of those things, you know. I got into punk rock and I stopped. You know, I just didn't do anything. Just I, I don't give a shit about anything. And uh, anyway, so so I I picked up a camera again. I started shooting, and then I I made a movie about child abuse called Two Eighty Eight. It's on Vimeo and it's free and it's extremely heavy. But if you got 15 minutes, I'd watch it. It's a it's a heavy, a heavy film. And uh, so then I'm thinking, well, what now? What you know, like COVID's going on or whatever. I thought, well, I'm just I'm going to make a TSOL movie. So, so the other guys in the band they didn't know what I was doing. Like they they the only person in that band who saw that movie before the premiere was Greg Keane, our keyboard player, because he scored it. So hmm. the other guys hadn't seen what was, they had no idea what was going on over there. And, uh, you know, and, and it was just kind of like, I didn't want to do the standard punk rock documentary. Sure. You know, we've seen it. You got Henry in there. You've got Dave Grohl. You got, you know, it's like all these, it, it, it's <laughs> like, I didn't want to make a movie where there were cool people saying that we were cool and that there were new 
upcoming band saying we influenced any of them. It's like, yeah, fuck that noise, <laughs> man. So, so I just said, I'm just going to keep it to people that were with us, just with us. And then tell the story and cut to the other guys and bring them in. And, uh, you know, and that, and that's what happened. And it, it's one of those things where it, it reminded me so much of like punk rock, because mm-hmm. like in punk rock, the beginning of punk rock, no one gave a shit about right. us. You couldn't get people interested. Nobody gave a shit. Nobody was telling us what to do, how to make records, how to do whatever. It was just like, hey, fuck you. I'm in a band. I'm making a record. That was <laughs> what it was, right? So the, it was the same thing with this movie. It's like, you know, yeah, fuck you. I'm making a movie. Well, you can't do it like that. Well, I am. So fuck right. you. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and that's that's what that movie was. And uh I don't know. I had fun making it. And it, you know, the sad thing, I mean, there's a couple of sad things, but one of our friends, human t-shirt that's in the movie, he died right after the movie. Mm. Well, he basically died before the movie came out. He, he passed away before the movie came out. So uh, one of the things that you talked about in the, in the film, and it's, it's, it's so funny you bring this up because it's something that's absolutely true. You know, being a punk kid in the suburbs was was a was a dangerous lifestyle. I grew up in a in a suburban town, you know, south of Boston, and I knew one kid who had an Iggy Pop record, and you know, he yeah. he stuck out like a sore thumb. And the only reason he knew it, it was because his brother had it. But yet, my friend Phil was really into it, and and he would talk about these these bands. I thought the kid was cool, but there were some people thought, you know, you know, what is this shit? And I just remember, you know, back then, so they were you know, talking like 1980, 84 when I was in high school. And I remember parents at the time, you know, thinking of the very worst thing that can happen to a child was to have that kid shave his head and go to an all ages show. <laughs> like that was, I'd rather have my kid be a drug addict or kill somebody. But if he becomes a punk, then we're going to have a problem. That was a real attitude back then. Yeah. And I, t- you know, you try to explain to these people. Like, I remember Biafra one time, he's like, oh, you live in the suburbs. It's, it's like, yeah, man, you bet. I, I'd love to see you hang out here for a couple of weeks. Let's find out what's going on with you, pal. Because yeah. because people, especially I grew up in Long Beach, and it was, you know, the area that I grew up in, lower middle class, and there were a lot of heavy drug use, heavy, you know, greaser guy you know it's like pony boy it's like <laughs> it's goddamn <laughs> like that you know except there were less outsiders than right. there were on the inside and uh you know and it was a constant you were hated yeah everywhere yeah everywhere it's not like 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 in the movie i say in the city you can be down there you know wearing a shower cap on this nobody gives a shit they they actually it's the opposite they try to avoid you you look like that in the city. They try to walk around. Just I'm going to walk around this guy and go about my business. Now, you look like that in downtown Disney, wearing shit like that. You're getting, you're going to jail. You're yeah. getting assaulted. You're getting beaten on. And I and some of these people never understood that. They never understood how, you know, you know how it is. You were hated. Yeah. And I, and and so so for me, I was a I was a good surfer, and I caused trouble. I was a good looking kid and I surfed and I caused trouble. So I was popular before punk rock. Like it wasn't like I got in a punk band. It was like people knew me at school. When I got kicked out of one school to the next school, Mm -hmm. people would be going, oh, you know, Jack Grisham's coming to our school. (laughs) It was one of those. (laughs) I was was doing, you know, even like a little hippie. I was doing some fucked up shit, you know, as a kid. And uh, so, so when I shaved my head, it was like crazy. They're like, you know, I he's what's the matter with him? He's, you know, he's gone off the deep end. He's, you know, blah blah blah, all that. I, I remember a friend of mine's mom was like so despondent over the fact that his that their kid was 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 into the music and had shaved his head. And I remember saying to the mom, I think it was the last time I was allowed in the house. I said to the mom, I said, well, what were you doing in the fifties when Elvis came out? She said, what do you mean? She said, well, was every kid wearing long hair with their hair pretty much like your sons i said well it was pretty much like your sons i said and when elvis was on tv were, the, were everybody really happy about it or were they outraged she said well they were outraged i said well seems to me your kids act in the same way you did in the 50s it's just different oh that didn't go over well i'm sure i, it, I was told to leave <laughs> yeah i was told to get that out of the house but it's well, but, no, it's, it's, but it's, it's true every generation has to have that kind of rebellion otherwise i think it makes teenagers go crazy 
Yeah, exactly. And you know, it's funny when I, so when I first shaved my head, so my dad was gnarly military. So he was, mm. my dad served in world war two, Korea and Vietnam. Like he, he would, I used to have to salute him when he came home. You know, it's when I was a little kid. And, uh, so when I first shaved my head, he was stoked. He's like, all right, get yourself squared away. You know, that, that kind of thing. And then when he realizes that I shave my head so people can't grab my hair in fights. <laughs> He's like, right, wait a minute, you know, lay off the grease. <laughs> Your head's covered with grease. Oh my God. Then it was a whole different story, yeah. you know, and I'd walk in the house wearing a dress and, you know, with a shaved head, black guy in a dress, man. And my dad just like, <laughs> so bummed, but so bummed constantly. You know, I've I've talked to a bunch of some of the old hardcore guys. I mean, the, you talk to Keith and you know the Agnew brothers and Bill Stevenson and uh, and Jello and Joey Shithead and, the, and and those guys. And you know, it's always for whatever reason, it always seems to come back when we look back in the, of the eighties about this this period where it becomes kids are going to shows and then all of a sudden the jocks come in and then there's fights and it's it's violence and next thing you know, you you can't even have a show unless the police show up. I know at some point, you know, with all the violence that that uh, had been following maybe you guys and others, that you just decided enough is enough, and you didn't really want any any part of it before. How bad did things really get before you made the decision to go on? Well, it wasn't okay. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't the violence that was the problem. You know, violence is never the problem. It's always the solution. <laughs> 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 I'm joking. But uh, so so when we first got into punk rock and I, and I go into this in the movie, the violence was against the people that came against us. This right. was from outside. So you got these guys coming to beat up on punks and the violence went back towards them. That's what it was. We were defending ourselves. So like the first first round of punks, you know, were more arty kind of not real athletes, if right. you will, you know, and then, and then we come in and we're like bigger and, you know, we're surfing and skating and, you know, do, and we're in good shape and we're assholes. <laughs> and now that violence is going back. But when I got tired of it, when it was punk on punk violence, so you're going to the show and groups of punks are beating up on punks trying to go to the show. That was my problem. Yeah, that's what people don't understand. Like a lot of these guys complain, like somebody fat Mike was going on to me. He goes, you know, he goes, they blame you guys for wrecking the scene in L.A. You know, it's like, hang on a minute, man. We we protected the scene when it started. And then when the violence was just in the clubs, punk on punk, I was done because that's that's something else. That's something different, you know. One was violence against those that would come down on us. Second was in family fighting, which yeah. is like, yeah, I've had enough of this. I'm done. So I've read, I've tried to read as much about the, the riot of the SIR studios in, in 1983. And there's not a lot that I've found written about what happened and, and, and why it happened. But tell me a little bit about that night. Yeah, and if you go and and one, I'm not trying to pump it. If you go into the, if you go further along in the in the movie, there's a whole section about it. Um, it was just a show. It was a show. It wasn't supposed to be there. It was a rehearsal place that Gary Tovar rented from Golden Voice. They said, "Hey, you can't sell tickets here." So he's selling tickets across the street, and it got oversold. Somebody, the cop showed up. And I guess somebody th threw a bottle or something. Like, that's how it started. I hear there's one guy that claims he started it. Great. Good for you. <laughs> you know, I guess so. Who You know, who knows? But then the police came in. And, and what screwed me up is when the police came in, I said, hey, if we all sit down on the floor, they can't take us. And hmm. so 2,000 people just sat down on the floor. And it was like a real... To me, it was it was a real. Uh, I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't thinking about anything about it. And then it was, hey, there's more of us than there is them. Let's get them. You know, whatever the fuck it is. But it was the aftermath of of that riot thing that really screwed me up. Yeah. Because I would go to shows and people would go, hey Jack, tell us what to do. Tell us what to do. Like 
yelling stuff out. It's like, man, I don't want that. I, I, you know, it's like, so that was the end for me. Yeah. Shortly after that, shortly after that riot was, was the end. I was done. I, I was, I, I'm going to go do something else. I do want to talk about, you know, some of the things that you've done since that happened over the last several years. I mean, obviously you know, you're making films and, and, uh, and, and all the writing you've done, particularly the things that kind of leap out to me is, you know, You've written some fictional stuff, but a lot of autobiographical stuff too, like you know, American Demon and uh, you know, Principle of Recovery, in which you talk about your your path to you know sobriety. You've been, I believe, since 1989 that you've yeah, uh, 35 you, years. That's yeah, terrific. Uh, tell me a little bit about, about that and and that journey to decide or or what got you to the point where you said enough is enough. I need to save my life here. Well, I, you know what's funny about it is I, so so the guys in my band. You know, like I don't favor the needle. I, I'm not a I'm not a heroin guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I'm not a heroin guy. For me, it's just you know blow and pills. And high school man, you know, hey, we're eating mushrooms and fuck. We we're eating these pills. We're getting some blow. We're gonna drink. We're gonna you know go out and get in fights. Fuck whatever the hell it is. You know and uh, and it was funny because the people that were around me were the ones that were saying I had a problem. And I couldn't see that I had a problem whatsoever. I didn't see, it just seemed like what I was doing in my life just seemed like that's the way it goes. I was 26 years old. I was living at my mom's, couldn't hold a job. You know, my car, I had, I had just destroyed this car. I got warrants out for my arrest. I got restraining orders on me. I got a girl pregnant. I take another girl to Mexico and marry her at the same time. It was like just a complete... <laughs> Just a shit show. Yeah. Just a shit. Show. But to me, it just seemed like this is my life. Yeah. Like I didn't see I didn't see the problem. You know, and there's there's a line where people say, Oh, if you want what we have, it's like, bitch, I don't want what you have. I want you to get the shit I have to behave. <laughs> That's what I want. And uh, you know, and it was so it was so interesting. I didn't realize I had a problem until I stopped doing it. Yeah. And it's it's you stop when you realize the problem because I was unsedated. And then I just started, man, it was like this, this open wound. You know, I would, I would tell the story. It was like about the, like, you know, no offense to anyone, a terrible situation. When we first got the report to the tsunami that hit Indonesia and that they go, oh, there was a tsunami, you know, blah, 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 you know, and then the next day, it's like, God, 10,000 dead. Oh, no, this many. And it just got worse and worse and worse as the days progressed. Right. And we really saw the scope of the damage. Well, that was my situation. I washed in on this tsunami. I got pills and booze and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, it starts to recede. The pills come out of my hand. The bottle pops out of my mouth. And all of a sudden, here's wreckage. Mm. Now I start seeing all this shit. And it was like Malcolm X said, you know, hey, I'm just a good old country boy, man. And the chickens have come home to roost. And that's what happened. My chickens had come home to roost. All of a sudden, I was living in this dreamland. And I wake up and it's like, hey, guy, you you live at your mom's. Hey, you screwed up everybody. You have burned people. You have screwed people up. You got warrants, restraining orders. You're blamed for your father's death. You're you know, you sexual abuse, physical abuse, man, I was just an open wound. And, you know, thank God, for some reason, I didn't stick anything in me to make that go away. Yeah. I, I was willing to just go through it and feel it and just accept the consequences of what I had done. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a long journey. It, it, it's still a long, <laughs> it's still a long sure. journey. And then, and then just to realize, like, what a selfish, self-centered pe shit I was to people. You so, know, it, it, it's so crazy. They talk about that illness that you're emotionally immature, you know. And uh, and I was like a, a baby, man. That, yeah. That's what it was. Mostly I was like a baby. When, when, a, when, a, when a, a young baby wants two things when it gets upset. It wants the bottle or the tit. And I'm a grown man. And when I got upset, it was give me the bottle of the tit. That was it. And, uh, you know, so just a lot of a lot of payback. I had to make amends to my father at his grave. I had to face up to a lot of stuff I had done. I had to be willing to turn myself in and go to jail for crimes I had committed. And uh, it was uh, it, it it's it's been a long road. But, you know, the cool thing now is, you know, uh, 
35 years later, I'm able to stick a hand out to people, tell them I understand, be supportive. And if anything, just be a symbol of saying, hey, look, man, you can play music, you can create, you can do all this stuff, you know? Yeah. And uh, what I think what's really interesting is, you know, you know, to be able to write about it and, and to tell those to tell those stories and to be open and to be vulnerable in, in that moment as you're writing about what you've been through and what you've endured and then to get back with the band and, and play music again, you know, a lot of people may be triggered by regurgitating all of that back up. And it seems like you're at the point in your life where, you know, this is all just a part of the journey. And, you know, to reclaim some of these things has actually been pretty empowering for you. Yeah, and it has now, but you're you're right about that. So the first book I wrote, American Demon, the, the autobiography, that was dark, man, because I had to go, I was so far away from that. And I had to sit there and say, well, what is, what is whiskey taste like? Mm. You know, because I'm writing this, you know, what does it feel like when you hit somebody in the face? What do the teeth feel like? How, how much movement is there between the lips and the skin before you hit teeth? What, what does it feel to have a cut knuckle, to, to want to die, to kill yourself, to climb up in a sewer? How does it feel to look at your kid, man, when, when they're just so fucking, they're so disgusted at you? Like, remembering when I walked in when my daughter was born to walk into that hospital and just have everyone in there look at me with disgust. Hmm. You know, it it was just, you know, so I had to sit and relive all that stuff. And uh, in the middle of it, they, my daughter and some friends did an intervention on me. They said, hey, you're, you're not well. You're, you know, you're unsound. I was writing 18 hours a day. I, I'm, I'm. You know, I'm not taking care of myself. I'm in this little thing, you know, and uh, and my daughter was basically like going to move me onto her couch. You know? mm. <laughs> Fucking give me a pair of Depends. <laughs> I said, look, just let me get this out. Let me just get it out. Let me lance this. Let me get it out, man. And, uh, you know, that's that's what I did. Yeah. I, I just got it out. And then it was easier after that. You know, uh, like the first time I went to my dad's grave, uh, I was blamed for my dad's death in a court case. It was uh, so my dad had a heart attack at work and he died. And uh, so there was a court case because it was work, you know, that kind of a thing, you know. And they said, oh, it's work, stress, work, stress, work, stress. But his work came back and said, yeah, it's stress. All right. But it's not work stress. They said that my dad was showing up at, at, you know, work saying, hey, my kid's arrested again. Hey, they shot at our house. Hey, that, you know, mm. blah, blah, blah. My mom used to lay in bed at night and pray that I wouldn't die. Like, that's how she got through a lot of this stuff. And um, so when I had to face my dad, and, and here's an interesting part of it. A lot of people say, hey, you didn't have anything to do with his death. You didn't have anything to do with his death. You know, that's not your fault. It's him. It's like, yeah. I understand it. But for me, I had to accept my part in his death. Sure. That I did create that stress for him, that I did hurt him. Was I the whole reason? No, but I was a few nails in him. That's for sure. And so I had to go to my dad's grave and mm. basically do a graveside amends to him for what I had done, you know, and, uh, you know, and to release that, to let it go, you know, to let go of my anger, my resentment towards him. And uh, and then luckily my mom lived until she was 91. So uh, I got to be straight with her. And when I went and made amends to my mom, I asked her, uh, you know, how did you deal with me? And like I said, she said, I'd, I'd lay in bed at night and pray that you wouldn't die. So after that, I called my mother every day for the last 20 something years of her life. I, wow. I called her every day and I said, hey, I just wanted to tell you I love you. That I'm all right and I love you. It's a, it's an amazing story, and and I think what's important about it is people need to realize you. Know, it's never too late to start making those changes and and to start really you know focusing in on that uh, on that self awareness and 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 getting in touch with all that. I mean, I think it, it, to me it's a really important story to hear you talk about that. You know, even people who are maybe seem like the most problematic can turn their lives around by doing the work and just you know, uh, understanding, you know, their, their strengths and their, and their weaknesses. Right. And, and I think that the one thing too, uh, you know, cause people had asked me in time, they said, well, what's different between what you're doing and straight edge? <laughs> Look, I don't care what anyone <laughs> else does. I firmly believe that people's lives are their lives and it's their right to do whatever they want to do with their life. 
great. You want to get loaded? Great. You want? I mean, I give out beer. They give us beer at our, our gigs. You know, they're like, well, we dropped off a case of beer. It's like, well, none of us drink. So <laughs> who are we giving this to? It's like, you know, it's not like get that evil substance out of our <laughs> eyes. You no, know, it's, but it's I one, don't give a fuck. It's one more thing. I don't to care what anybody does. It's one more you, thing to you, sell you, at the merch it, table. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I remember they used to say, you know, oh, don't don't give get a blowjob or what, I don't know what kind of craziness they were coming up with. You know, it's like, it's like, Oh my God, I don't care what someone does sexually, physically, whatever the hell, as long as it's not hurting anyone else. But my job is when someone says, Hey, I have a problem. My responsibility says, Hey, can I help? Can I help yeah. you? That's it. That's great. But, you know, yeah. we don't preach about it. It's no, no big deal. You know, yeah, I, I'm. It's it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this stuff. Like I said, I've I've been an admirer of uh, TSOL for a long time, and I know you know I've heard the stories, but still love the records. And uh, and I and like I said, I I really enjoyed A Side Graffiti. I think it's it's awesome, and it's great to see you're you're, you're doing great and and healthy and in a good place in your life. I, I I'm happy for you. Yeah, and thank you, and I I really appreciate it. And it's 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 just a good it's a good life. Yeah, God, you know it. It really, it really is. You know, sometimes I, I just, you know, I just sit there. I've, I've, I've basically kind of come to in so many crazy places, you know, and I'll, I'll say this thing before I shut up. So Tom Wilson, who produced all those early TS well records, except for the first one uh, at the SIR show in the middle of the show, somebody comes up to me on stage and says, Hey, Tom wants to talk to you. Now Tom's mixing our sound <laughs> out outside. He's mixing it. And I get on the thing and he goes, hey, he goes, look at what you're doing. He goes, just stop for a minute and look at what you're doing. Look at this. See this. And what he was trying to tell me is to just take that moment out and appreciate where you are, what's happening, what you're doing at this moment. Now, at the time, I didn't really understand. It sounded like hippie shit to me, you know, but <laughs> but so much later on, I, I've just stopped and said, wow, man, you're you're in you're in Cuba. You're you're yeah. you're here in Argentina. You're you're on stage here. You you're with your daughter walking on the beach. You're you know, and just stop and just hey man, just take a second. Take a second. Check it. Yeah. So Jack, I really appreciate the time today. Best of luck with everything. Hope you're gonna do well. You're well. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Jack. Okay. Thank you. The name of the new album from TSOL is called A Sign Graffiti, and the name of the documentary is called Ignore Heroes. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe, rate it, share it, tell all your friends about it. Be sure to follow on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for regular updates. You can also email me at Bax at rock102.com. Thanks to Metro, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and Chicopee. And thanks to you for listening to Baxi's musical podcast.